In our last episode, we talked about and tasted the food that made its way to the dinner tables of many American consuls who traveled around the world in the 18th and 19th centuries. If you have not heard it already, I would highly recommend listening to our previous episode after you finish with this one. But high tea and blamosh, some of the things we tasted in the previous episode, were not quite what most folk ate either on American ships or in places that American consuls lived. While American consuls may have certainly partaken in diplomatic dinners or dined with their local contacts, there is little evidence to suggest that their taste became culturally assimilated or diverse. I'm thinking that something that's come up for us a couple of times is how consuls are, act sort of like ethnographers. And so we know that Maria Balestier, for instance, I mean, she's not a consul, obviously, but she's yeah. a consul's wife. You know, she's she's looking at her surroundings with an eye towards telling other people about yeah. what it is. And I think the same thing would be true for somebody like Alexander Russell Webb, who Absolutely. writes all of these things back home with the intention of it being published in a newspaper. Yeah. And so I can imagine that the kinds of things that they take note of are the the things that are weird to them. Yes. You know, it's not just like, okay, and everybody had rice again for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, not yeah, interesting. Yeah, Nobody yeah, cares yeah. about that. They only care about cockfighting. Because, because they're, they're not writing for right. historians. Right. Who they're they're writing like, no, we want to know. Tell us what on the ground, more often than not, American consuls prefer to socialize and dine with their European counterparts. Their dinners, including many kinds of meat, fruit, and alcohol, prepared in Western ways. When we do have mentions of local food as consumed by American consuls, it is either a delicacy, as a ritual of trade diplomacy, something offered on board the ship while on voyage, or, as in the case of the American consuls in Algiers, when they were forced to commune with locals while imprisoned. I'm Deepthi Murali, and this is Consolation Prize, a podcast about the United States in the world through the eyes of its consuls. In this episode, my co-producer Christensen and I share the historical food recipes that we made and shared with our colleagues and discuss what is often mentioned only in passing. Ordinary, everyday food. The kinds of food that were not served within the Sultan's palace or in governor mansions, but that is ever-present as a background character in our episodes and in the lives of American consuls abroad. Yeah, let's head down that way. This is the oldest fish market, open air fish market in the U.S. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, from 1805. It's 17 years older than the Fulton Fish District in New York. So, and I will say, like, just think. So we've been thinking about the different, I guess, structures that are built into food, right? And as right. we're standing here, looking at all of these little venues, all the different signs, the different kind of fish. I think it's also interesting to keep in mind of Samuel Shaw's journey, how choice is not really a factor when you're on the ship. Like, especially right. if you're going longer than normal, whatever you catch is kind of what you get. Hence the turtle episode. Yes. Like, what did yeah. we have today? We caught a turtle. Make it work. But here, we, you just get, you get to pick whatever it is. It is impossible to consider any kind of international travel in the age before airplanes without giving a thought to the extended lengths of time travelers spent on sea confined aboard vessels that had limited quantities of food and drink. In between the safe ports and harbors that ships called at to replenish their supplies, sailors and sea travelers supplemented their food supply with what they could catch from the sea. Most of the time, these were fish. But on occasion, we find mentions of turtles, seabirds like albatross, and even snakes. But fish constituted the main fresh food supply for those onboard American ships traveling to far away destinations. We're immersing ourselves in. So we have a list of popular fish that we pulled from 
Is it, was it just, where did you find the list? It's from Samuel Shaw's journal. Journal, okay. Our number one on our list is hopefully to find shark yeah. to make this, but then we also are looking for alewives and herring, but we would also note that he also had a lot of salmon and yes. cod. And mackerel. And mackerel. And so, but we're going to stick with our shark plan because yeah. that's what the and recipe calls. And turtle. Oh, that's also right. Let's, yeah, let's not do turtle and we get crabs all the time. So let's look for yeah. shark okay. and we'll make it. The first U.S. consul to Canton, China, Major Samuel Shaw, was clearly excited about his first trip and the financial prospects of bringing back tea in exchange for what he considered as America's secret super commodity, ginseng. The journals he maintained during his four voyages from the U.S. to China between 1784 and 1794 give us an account of some of the longest voyages undertaken by Americans in this era. In his journals, Shaw recorded fish of all kinds and his experience with tasting them. In the warm waters of the Atlantic near the Canary Islands, he tasted a fish called bonito, a type of tuna. Sometimes flying fishes landed on the vessel, making an easy meal. On one occasion, the crew of the Empress of China, the celebrated ship that took Shaw to Canton, caught a two and a half foot long shark, which they prepared into a couple of different dishes. For the first dish, they pickled half the shark for an hour, then dried the pickled piece in the sun, and then broiled it. For the second dish, the remainder of the shark meat was boiled and eaten with plain butter. By the way, the food we have tasted and the recipes that we have tested in this episode have to be treated as a well-researched, but nonetheless modern, interpretation. Like, for example, we're not sure what kind of shark they caught on the Empress of China or how different it tasted from the shark meat we bought at the DC Municipal Wharf. Okay, now that we have the disclaimer in place, let's continue with our shark dish tasting. Since neither Chris nor I were adventurous enough to pickle shark meat, we opted to try out the boiled shark recipe. My seven-year-old son joined me in cooking and tasting the fish. Tastes like tuna. Yes, it's like a. Oh, this is really good. It's good. Chris had somewhat of a different cooking experience from us. I'm not the biggest fan of Samuel Shaw at the moment, who I blame for the disaster that was this process. Um, it wasn't quite a, the only thing I found online about how to boil fish, in this case shark, was make sure to use a large pot. And we, as Deepthi and I have split up the shark, I had four very small pieces that I think amounted to maybe half a pound. So in my mind, it didn't warrant a huge pot. So I used a smaller pot, which boiled over incredibly quickly and sent the juices of the said shark all over the kitchen. While Chris's tasting did not go as smoothly as ours, we all agreed that boiled shark did not taste half bad. Not every sailor was preoccupied with what they were going to eat. Most sailors actually took to drinking for mental as well as social reasons on board. Consuls consistently recorded stories of alcohol-fueled brawls and death on board American ships. The grog popularized by the Royal British Navy after their colonization of Jamaica, was drunk in large amounts. Grog is watered down rum, approximately one part rum to four parts water. It is supposedly named after grogram, a woven fabric worn by the British Admiral Edward Vernon, who first began rationing rum in this way to control his men. The addition of lime to this mix was to prevent scurvy amongst the crew. I mean, it's not the worst thing, it's just yeah. clearly mostly water, but yeah. I'm sure at the end of the day it would get the job done. I mean, compared to the tea punch, this is, this. I can see why, you know, sailors were drinking this like water. And mm -hmm. partly they were doing this so that the water does not get, like, the water in caskets would quickly have like a film of algae, 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 mm. algae. Yeah. Um, I can see how they could, like, if water became so murky and unpalatable, the drinking water, mm -hmm. like this would make it easier to drink the water. Right. 
Sometimes voyages went awry. The sea was a dangerous place in the 18th and early to mid 19th centuries for American consuls and other voyagers, but land was a dangerous gamble too. In a book examining journals and other records of New England merchants in Africa, there are mentions of American crews who were forced to beg for food in West Africa in places where they did not intend to land. In episode 9 of season 1 of our podcast, we introduced two U.S. consuls to the Barbary states in the late 18th century. These two Americans, James Leander Cathcart and Richard O'Brien, were exceptionally well-suited for these jobs as both of them had spent a considerable part of their lives as sailors and as prisoners in Algiers after being captured on board American ships. In O'Brien's case, he was captured not once but twice. It is through the journals of Cathcart and O'Brien that we get to know a bit about the life of some American prisoners in North Africa. Even though Cathcart and O'Brien were not begging for food like the crews of stranded American ships, as prisoners, Cathcart's and O'Brien's food in the Algerian prisons was rationed. Their food was largely limited to black bread, beans and coffee. In the episode on Cathcart and O'Brien, we talked about how the day or the governor of Algiers used the act of drinking coffee together as a method of exerting power and control over prisoners and bestowing his good graces upon them. But unlike coffee, black bread and beans was just sustenance. While neither consuls talked much about the bread, Chris was able to track down a recipe for a somewhat fancier version of the black bread that prisoners in Algiers would have had. He baked it for our tea. So this brown bread, it has black molasses. Black, black bread. It does, yes. I can taste the molasses. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh yeah. It's kind of like pungent. Yeah, the, and, the, the, and, the, and the non-stained one is definitely better than the stained <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> the two, you don't have to say Well, it, imagine was... this is fresh from the day of Algiers' bakery, and that That's is from the prison. Fourth day so, of you know. The fresh and the stale bread made out of the same recipe tasted quite different. One could easily imagine the fresh loaf being sliced and buttered in a modern kitchen. The hearty slices that we shared were full of flavor. The stale bread was harder to slice, and it crumbled as we sliced through it. It was dry, coarser, and harder to swallow. bread would have been eaten with like was it it, it got paired with beans Cathcart and O'Brien were not the only ones with a staple diet of beans in this period beans of all kinds appear prominently in the cuisines of coastal Africa Asia and the Americas beans are easy to store can be made in large quantities are a good source of protein and are probably a lot cheaper than meat in this period Beans were quite definitely one of the everyday foods of the 18th and 19th century global world. The other common global commodity was rice. In coastal West Africa, boiled rice mixed with palm oil and prepared with spicy guinea pepper was a regular meal. When sailors of the ship Iris washed ashore in Sierra Leone in 1816, the spicy rice with chicken was their first hot meal in weeks. But let's return to the staple that started this discussion, beans. If you thought subsisting on black bread and beans was hard living, there were people living with far less in other parts of the world who come into focus through consular reports. In episode 12, we explore the lives of black Americans who chose to move to work in Mexican plantations in the 1890s. The life they hoped for turned into a disaster. By 1895, 153 black Americans were living in horrible conditions along the railroad instead of being able to support themselves on the plantation. They had to drink brackish water and to survive, they ate mesquite beans. <laughs> 
Until this episode, none of us at Constellation Price had heard of mesquite beans. But Chris and I were able to get hold of mesquite beans for the team to see and taste firsthand. It actually rattles. Mm, that's cool. I don't think I've ever eaten a thing that Many rattles before. Many things in the Southwest rattle. That's cool. Actually. It's like the, they also just... were surprisingly oak. Like I could not believe how much flavor. Yeah. So how do you? What do you? You just what bite do you into do it. With them? You just you bite into but it. But like make sure like a shell. chip. It actually yeah. says on the instructions: if chewing on pods, spit out seeds and rough parts before swallowing. <laughs> it's definitely one of those foods that takes a lot of effort to get to the thing that's edible. Yeah. It, it makes you work for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like too hard. I can't eat it. Right? <laughs> it does taste a little sweet, though. Mm -hmm. It is sweet. Like, if, yeah. you, if you take a bigger bite, and then you chomp on it, you can actually feel the sweetness more. I, I wonder if it's one of definitely those. just bit it like a chip before we yeah. read the instructions. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is interesting, but... Also, to actually subsist on just these, you'd have to be pretty or desperate. Or things like them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You'd have to be pretty desperate. So. I think of all the things, I think the mesquite beans are the hardest. Yeah. Um, to sort of think about it being like a the the source of food. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the the other things, yeah. Like, I mean, even the stale bread. Yeah, yeah. it's not great. But it's yeah. 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 <laughs> And it, well, and it's something that you can recognize and know that it's mm. something edible. Whereas I could imagine, like, if these are just growing somewhere, you'd have to know in advance that they were safe to eat. Otherwise, right. or you were so desperate that you or, eat and yeah, then find or out, you find out from somebody yeah. in your company dying. Yeah. Really need it in order yeah. to, to try just like sort of random plants that yeah. look like they might be edible. Yeah. So I can imagine it. It's just another layer of anxiety on top yeah. of actually sort of fleeing rough, you know, yeah. fleeing persecution. And not sure yeah. whether you're gonna make it, and yeah. then being so in dire need that you're just buying things that are growing along the railroad tracks, which sounds pretty terrifying to me. Traditionally, mesquite beans, the fruit of the namesake tree, were used by Native Americans for centuries to grind into flour and use in their atoli. The pods in the beans are quite nutritious and have a sweet taste as well as a spice-like flavor and aroma when roasted. In the deserts of the American South in Mexico, these beans, ripe in July, offered much-needed sustenance for itinerant peoples. And as it would seem, for the black Americans escaping Jim Crow era life in the southern states. Well, and you can imagine too that the people who are in Tuolilo probably don't have the contact with native people or even yeah. native oh, yeah. Mexican yeah. people of Spanish descent to know sort of the local understanding. Yeah. Because they're just transplanted there yeah. to do their thing on the plantation, so it's I would say it's pretty likely that they don't even have some of the native yeah. knowledge that would assist them, like in figuring out that you could grind these up into flour. Yeah. Despite food's obvious importance to survival. Consuls rarely mention it in their accounts unless it was something truly extraordinary. Instead, what we see most often is food mentioned as provisions or as a commodity, as something that appears on the long and detailed list of what people bought and sold. The reports of New England merchants sailing to Africa and back are filled with account logs of pounds and barrels of food items, rum, gin, tobacco, sugar, rice, beef, Cuban cigars. But if we look closely at these rather dry account keeping records, we will see food's connection to networks of class and race privilege, colonialism, and enslavement. For example, in early 19th century, New England merchants brought with them cloth from America along with muskets and gunpowders to sell in Madagascar. <laughs> 
In exchange, they received animal hides and jerked beef. While the hides were for tanneries in New England, the jerked beef was largely exported to feed enslaved plantation workers in Cuba. So, while New England consuls and merchants were mostly abolitionists and may not have transported enslaved people, their profits likely depended on larger, complex and interwoven networks of trade that included transporting food, clothing and other necessities for enslaved populations. So it's, an, it's interesting to think about how cuisine is universal in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but also very different in a lot of ways. So then you're kind of trying to figure out, okay, how can I relate to this? But also, am I going to be willing to go outside of what I know? And I think some consuls didn't have a choice, like Cathcart and O'Brien. You yeah. just have to eat what you eat, you know? But for others, I think there was more or less of a willingness to try the local cuisine yeah. as opposed to trying to maintain a bright line between themselves and the locals. And, you know, that's their loss in some ways if they chose to try to keep a bright line. I'm pretty sure Richard Waters tasted something close to what is local Boko because he did partake in meals at the summer yeah. palace of the sultan and so and this is a very very common arabic dish in zanzibar at this time and, yeah. and later so he had some version of this yeah and i think the closer the consuls are to being involved in government of their local place the more likely they yeah. would have been to have to try yeah. so it's like you don't yeah. go to the yeah. sultan's palace and be like no thank you <laughs> that's not really a thing you need to do but if they're dealing mostly with Americans and only sort of tangentially with the locals, I could imagine that they can be a little bit more entrenched in their Americanness. Our co-producer Megan Brett had an interesting hypothesis. The places where they are talking about food are also places where they're having masculine interactions. And for the most part, like food and how is the household arranged? You know, what kind of bedrooms are they having? That's whoever their domestic yeah. manager is, whether it's a wife or a daughter or a housekeeper. Um, that's female province, so we're getting the foods that are like at a sultan's feast, which yeah. is then you know a space that has masculine significance. Whereas, like, what do we eat for dinner today? Maybe, but this, like, even if the household members aren't necessarily learning how to cook the dish, like if the family is financially capable enough and they're in a position where the women have to do visiting and so they're not necessarily learning local food ways, yeah. being exposed to the availability of these new spices, do they bring that back and do they create female correspondence networks to be like, hey, new consul's wife, I will send you finished goods from the States if you will send me some more of that amazing cinnamon, you know. Yeah. I don't know, like, I don't know, but like the the ways the food ways are transmitted by the whole household. As Megan said, perhaps it is the lack of women in consular lives or the absence of the voices of the wives and daughters of American consuls in official records that has contributed to the dearth of information on the everyday eating habits of the consuls or their active interaction with local cuisines and peoples. In any case, it is yet another reminder of the gendered, racialized, and class-based practices of making and consuming food. If we want to tell the story of the US in the world through the eyes of its consuls, we also have to take into account what they are not seeing and what they were not eating we need to think more about how to read their reports and accounts against the grain, as historians like to say, meaning with a critical eye to all that a consul may not have seen or left unsaid. Reading against the grain allows us to account for the larger ways that things like food can shape and influence the lives and experiences of people from different cultures. In all of these stories, whether seen from the top down or the bottom up, food has been a powerful source of diplomacy and belonging 
but also exclusion and sheer survival. Constellation Prize is a podcast of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. This episode was produced by Deepthi Murley and Chris Stinson. If you want to know more about the food and drink we discussed in this episode, you can check out our show notes at constellationprize.rrchnm.org, where you can also find our full transcripts and a list of more resources. Special thanks to our executive producer, Abby Mullen, and team member, Megan Brett, for production assistance and partaking in our food tasting. Music for this episode is by Andrew Cody. Just as a reminder, even though we attempted to trace the authenticity of historical recipes, we cannot know exactly how these dishes were prepared. Additionally, modern ways of farming and fishing have almost definitely changed both the taste and the preparation possibilities for these dishes. As a result, our reactions and hypotheses are based on our current social and culinary contexts. Thanks for listening.